You know, I still remember back in the early 90s when I first upgraded to an Amiga from a Commodore 8-bit machine. It was a real revolution. Those kind of leaps in computing power and capabilities don't really happen all that often these days. But back then, the jump in graphical power, audio, storage, a full graphical user interface just felt like such a next step. But there was one thing that I really missed. When you turned on most 8-bit machines, they all had one thing in common. They dropped you straight into a programming language, usually basic, that meant you could get straight into programming your machine. But when I got my Amiga 500 Plus with Workbench 2.0, I turned the machine on and instead of asking me to enter a command, it prompted for a disk. It turned out you couldn't actually do anything with the machine without first loading some software. Now, in all honesty, I've never been a very proficient programmer, but I did enjoy typing in examples out of the manuals and then magazine listings and examining how they worked or didn't work 99% of the time. So not having an instantly accessible programming language at my fingertips did feel a bit like something was missing. AmigaDOS version 2.0 did actually come with a language built in, AREX, but despite the fact that you could make quite capable programs with it, most Amiga users used AREX as a scripting or macro language to interact with other programs. And besides, my A500 Plus didn't come with any sort of manual for AREX, and as a young kid, I didn't really understand all that well what it was. Early versions of the Amiga Workbench did come with a version of BASIC called Amiga BASIC, written by Microsoft, which did actually have some pretty nice features for the time, such as not requiring line numbers. And very early versions of the Amiga came with a BASIC from Metacomco. Amiga BASIC, though, was never too well received by the Amiga user base. Maybe it was just too much of a departure from 8-bit basics, or it just lacked the functionality to take advantage of the Amiga's advanced hardware. Either way, no form of basics shipped with my machine, and things like C and assembly, as interesting as they looked to me, did seem a bit too complicated for my pre-teenage mind at the time. I'll be honest, I did miss basic. The other major 16-bit platform, the Atari ST, had a similar problem. Atari ST BASIC shipped with early ST machines, but was actually written by Metacomco, who, kind of ironically, worked on the original Amiga operating system. But, like Amiga BASIC, ST BASIC had its problems, and wasn't well received by most users. In fact, Compute Magazine in 1987 named one of its many flaws as among the worst BASIC bugs of all time. Users wanted an easy-to-use alternative that would better take advantage of the more powerful hardware in these machines. Enter STOS BASIC. Created by French programmers Francois Lyonnais and Constantine Satiropoulos, it was an easy-to-use form of BASIC that was designed with graphics and sound in mind, making it perfect for the things most kids wanted to make – games. I caught up with Francois recently to get some background on the creation of STOS. I was working with a group, a game creation group, uh, and when the Amiga, the Atari ST were, came out in France, uh, we wanted to do a replacement for the system. So it would have been a DOS-like system with a command line, black screen, and in every DOS computer at the time, you had a basic. So I, w I was the one who to, to do the basic. And, uh, but as I was a game creator, uh, you know, I immediately, uh, dove into my uh, my peche mignon, so I made a sprite engine and all the all the instructions to create games. That's it. So it turns out that STOS was originally a replacement for the Atari ST's gem operating system, but it turned out the basic was what people really wanted. So in the end, the product was stripped down to the basic interpreter, and when people saw what it could do, it started to take off. STOS was expanded with various add-ons, including a compiler, so basic programs could be executed without the need for loading STOS first. And of course it didn't take long before STOS got ported to the other major 16-bit platform and AMOS for the Amiga was born. Although, here in the UK in the early 90s, the name AMOS was more commonly known to viewers of the ITV soap Emmerdale Farm. AMOS don't want any speeches. 
so he's not going to get any. But I would like to propose a toast to wish him a very happy retirement. Yeah. To Amos! Yeah. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Now, I first read about Amos in Amiga magazines, and it looked really appealing being a basic language. It looked pretty powerful. And back then, most of the mags used to do columns and tutorials on Amos, and it wasn't long before I got hold of a cut-down demo version from a magazine cover disc. And that was when I realised just what a powerful language it really was. Amos was written for a base Amiga 500 system, so that would mean typically a 512K, or if you're lucky, one megabyte machine, with at most two floppy drives, and likely hooked up to a television set using the RF modulator. As back then, this is how most kids had their system set up in their bedroom, and the user interface is designed to be readable on that configuration. So when you load Amos, you're dropped into its 320 by 200 pixel full screen editor. And visually, it is quite reminiscent of something like the Commodore 64. But if you don't like using it, you can actually import plain ASCII files, so that means you can use whichever editor you want to make your listings. The editor itself has two different modes, Direct and Edit. Edit is where you can write full program listings and then test them and execute them after. And Direct mode means you can actually run your program line by line. Very useful if you want to find out if you've got a function or command correct. Amos is actually a very powerful variant of BASIC with over 500 commands built in. And lots of them are specifically written to take advantage of the Amiga's powerful graphics and audio hardware, including sprites, bobs, commands to control text, graphics, scrolling, all built in. It even comes with an included sprite editor and sample bank creator. In fact, Amos was so powerful that its own configuration program was actually written inside it. Of course, using some nice copper effects as well. In fact, making those demo scene style scrollers is a breeze using Amos. In 1991, just like Stoss, Amos received its own compiler, meaning you could compile the code without the need to run Amos first and distribute your software on bootable disks. And then it was followed by several different versions of Amos. A cut down, more simple to use version called Easy Amos. A version designed to make 3D programs and games called, quite logically, Amos 3D. And then the premium version, Amos Professional. But what was the difference between them? Well, you know, uh, the first one was Amos, the uh, Amos 1.3, and uh, the obvious, uh, it was an interpreted language, a real interpreted language, a, a fast interpreter, but still. Uh, so it was obvious uh, that the next one would have to be a compiler. And, you know, making a compiler is also kind of uh, really fun for a programmer because you actually uh, make code, you know, uh, uh, you make code that makes code. So it's uh, it's really fun. And then Easy Amos was uh, an idea, I think, of uh, Mish Miking, the, you know, the CEO of uh, or Richard Banner, um, my project manager. It was to make a simple version of Amos with a reduced instruction set, a better manual, simpler manual and make it for kids. So, and it was actually really, really, really good product. And uh, then we wanted to make version two of Amos and we made the mistake of calling it professional, you know, because it, it was everything but professional. So, and I, I, you know, Amos Pro was saluted uh, really well by journalists when it was out. Uh, it was the first ever application to get uh, five out of five in one of the major magazines in England. It, it was even not a uh, Europress magazine. It was the competitor. And then the journalist actually, he got, he got uh, slap on his fingers. <laughs> but yeah, uh, uh, but uh, uh, Amos Pro, um, you know, the mistake in the name, it should have been called Amos 2. It wasn't long before most of the major UK magazines gave away full versions of Amos on their cover disc, which of course meant much more software was released both in the public domain and commercially. Some great games were released using Amos, including the Valhalla series, It's the Wizard. No way, Infinity.
It's a book. Scorched Tanks, which was an Amiga version of the MS-DOS game Scorched Earth, and later went on to inspire Andy Davidson to create the massive game Worms. Orc Attack, which was a remake of a Commodore 64 classic. Let's rock! And this very impressive Arkanoid clone that was released as late as 2003 using Amos called Babanoid and really showed off the graphical power of Amos. In fact, Francois is still contacted today from people who got their big break using Amos. Yeah, and actually, you know, uh, it's kind of a fantastic story. Uh, since a couple of years, uh, I regularly receive messages uh, from people on Facebook or LinkedIn uh, just thanking me for having changed their life. I mean, I'm not kidding. Uh, you know, because they learned to program with Amos, they loved it, and uh, then they chose a career in IT. And, uh, you know, all of them are very happy and have a very high position. So it was certainly a good learning tool, you know, because, uh, you know, when you're, when you're a kid, you do not count time. You just want to do something and you will spend as much as you need to do it. And you're only satisfied when it's finished. And so that's the, way, the only way to learn, you know, and discover your passion. So, yeah, I must have received like 50 or 50 of such emails. And I mean, each time it's so fantastic to somehow I've done something good and it's really satisfying. So Amos was great for people who wanted to tap into the power of the Amiga's custom chips without learning the low-level languages like Assembler. But what about today? More than 25 years since the last release of Amos Professional, Amos is back. Now, I was at Pixel Heaven in Poland over the weekend, and Francois was there demoing Amos 2, a 21st century update of Amos made for modern systems that can actually still run the original code and lots more. So why was now the right time to bring Amos back? I don't know, uh, because, uh, well, because first of all, I've got a job uh where i work eight hours per day so uh, for a programmer eight hours is uh you know half part-time job <laughs> so, and uh, i'm alone i don't know many people so i've got a lot of and it's good to for a moment just to be with me uh, me myself and i and uh so i have time uh, I, you know, browse on what I should do, and it was obvious, and uh, I always wanted to do that, you know, do a compiler for Amos that makes JavaScript, you know, it's because I love JavaScript, it's a fantastic, it's, it's a game engine, it's a JavaScript, so, yeah, the... and, you know, uh, I took the decision to do it in uh, the end of November, and the first thing, uh, uh, you know, and so the project was, uh, it was, December was a bit difficult, but starting in January, then it it rolled. So it's a it's a compiler. So uh, you for the moment you can do it, but you will. That's the goal. You do uh, Amos compiler, Amos to compile uh, my program dot Amos, uh, and in the Amos program you've got the banks, the source code, etc. The compiler first extracts all the resources and the source codes and create a modern application, which is basically a folder where you have the source code in ASCII, so you can use any editor to edit it, extract all the images of the banks and this one, um, save them at, as individual PNGs, the music, the sound, so it extracts everything. 
And then you use your favorite uh, source code editor, who for me is Visual Studio Code, and uh, you program using the exact same syntax, you know, same. It com understands all the Amos program, Amos Pro, uh, with the extensions, and uh, you compile it, and then you run it in your browser. The mm. advantage of a web-based application is that you can wrap it uh, so you actually create a native application for every platform that contains embedded a JavaScript and a fake browser. Well, yeah, a real browser, but embedded. So the size of the application is a big, big, like 30 megs. But really, you don't care about that anymore. You know, with uh, the Amos 2 uh, application, they will run on everything. Linux, Windows, Mac OS, iOS and Android. Everything. So I've opened uh, amos2.net, so the URL is simple, but the website is still under heavy work and I'm not a web designer, so it's a bit of a core for me to do. But uh, if you where I'm most active for the moment is on my Patreon page. Uh, so I've created a Patreon and you're welcome to come and help me and participate, not only with money, you know, uh, I'm looking for help, people who test the new instruction, who report bugs, who suggest things, you know, get to make a community, revive the Amos spirit and, you know, make build a community. When it's over, uh, I will uh, try to, quote, market it uh, as a um, uh, learning tool for kids, you know, learn to code uh, in basic because basic, the, you know, basic has disappeared. It used to be everywhere. And you, I mean, it was simple. The first program I did was bug free. And I did it five, two minutes after switching on the computer. It's just print hello, run. My first program, two minutes, no bugs. I mean, <laughs> without knowing anything. And now when you want to make something on a computer, either you get a game engine like Unity, so you've got to so, you know, watch video on YouTube, or Click Team Fusion, still it's uh, simpler, but it's not that simple. And you don't have the immediate gratification of uh, having made a program. So that's what's like, the simplicity. And you know, it's not their fault, but it's because Microsoft made Visual Basic. Uh, they, they in, at, the, at first they wanted it to be a hobbyist tool and they were surprised that Pro were starting to use it. But you cannot say that you are a Pro and you are programming in BASIC because everyone will say you're lame, of course. So that's why, you know, when you, when you ask a programmer, oh, do that in Visual Basic, oh, no, I'd rather do that in C++ or oh, in machine language, I'm a real pro, you know. <laughs> So that's why, that's why BASIC is no, no longer there. And uh, I think there is one BASIC uh, on Steam, I've seen that, but uh, uh, you know, the market is empty. And uh, properly, uh, so uh, just I want to reassure everyone that Amos Pro and the extension, everything compatible with Amiga, with everything that was on the Amiga and a few extra like the ability to rotate and zoom the bobs, you know, modern machine use is going to be free forever for individuals. Uh, for schools, uh, no. Uh, and for companies, but I guess companies will not uh, use, uh, use Amos, but schools could. So uh, I plan to set it and uh, to go to um, the Bet Show, for example, in London. I've been there quite a lot with Click Team, so I, I'd be happy to go back there and, uh, you know, uh, try to actually live from Amos. Now, as a kid who grew up using Amos and remembering the fun I had with it back in the day, it is incredible that a whole new generation of programmers are going to be able to cut their creative teeth once again using Amos 2. And if you'd like to find out more and get involved in it, you can back Amos 2 on Patreon, join the official Facebook group for daily updates, and even join their new forum on their website, amos2.net, and rediscover the joy of programming. And if you've enjoyed watching this video, I've got loads more nostalgic videos like this on my channel. Make sure you subscribe and click the bell icon to get notified when I upload a new video. And if you'd like to hear more about the story of Amos, I actually did a full 60-minute interview with its creator, Francois Lyonnais, on my weekly Retro Hour podcast. I'll put a link in the video description. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you in the next vid.